All right, so I'm live here and hopefully over on YouTube and hopefully people can hear me. YouTube has some technological challenges. So hopefully everybody here and over on YouTube can hear me clearly now. So I'm gonna give folks a couple more minutes to join. Today we will be reading the first chapter of Life After Death. Hey, of Life After Death. The first chapter and talking about it. So I'm hoping everybody can hear me. I see you said you pre-ordered it. Uh, I'm hoping that is good too. Some people were commenting on my YouTube channel saying that it wasn't. So I'm super nervous, but super excited to dive in. So I'm gonna just give it another minute just to make sure that everyone can hear me. So folks on YouTube said they still can't hear me. I don't know what's going on over there, but please come over to Instagram if y'all can't hear me. Instagram, y'all can hear me, right? Just want to make sure. So yeah, just going to give it another minute. And hopefully folks can hear me. So yes, so hopefully everyone can hear me clearly. Excuse these loud streets. <laughs> so I see, yeah, YouTube still having hearing challenges. The audio isn't working. I don't know why. I've hooked up my microphone. It's still not coming through. But hopefully, yes, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So we're going to go ahead and get started. If y'all can't hear me clearly, let me know. But we're going to read the first chapter. I haven't read it yet was waiting to read it with y'all. So let's just dive right in and see what we got. If y'all got it too, read along. If not, I'm gonna read it for all of us. Y'all, I'm so nervous um, because I'm so scared that she's gonna mess it up, but hopefully she doesn't. So here we go. All right, so it starts off with an intro poem. We say we didn't feel it, but we felt it. We say we didn't see it, but we saw it. We say we didn't hear it, but we heard it. We pretended we never knew it, but we know it. Who? All of us. So that's the intro poem. All right, chapter one. Whew. Gunshots, Brooklyn born, I know the sound. No matter whose finger is on the trigger, a nigga versus a nigga, niggas versus the law, or law versus niggas, gunshots fired anywhere in the world means pay attention, motherfuckers. But after these three shots, I don't hear no clapback, running feet, or screeching police sirens. I don't hear no cops calling out bullshit commands like freeze. I don't hear the scream of the ambulance or the swift feet of the curious running to the scene of the incident. I don't hear the director calling out cut after having called out action. I don't hear the cheers, shout outs, or big ups from the VIP crowd who I know had gathered because I am the one who arranged their VIP passes to be the only ones invited to accompany the film crew on my prison release day. I can't even hear the howl of the wind, which normally is so loud upstate New York where I was locked up, that we could hear it from inside the prison walls. Depending on where we were in the building, fuck hearing, I can't even see. Everything is deep black. Oh shit, that's how I know. I went to Santiago and the one who got shot dead. What? Y'all, I'm sorry. What? Okay, so. It opens up with Winter having gotten shot. All right, all right, I'm gonna keep going. I don't have no big fear of death. Never really even thought about it. 15 years on lock, I knew chicks who chased death, thought it was a better option over the rough lives they were living. I knew women who cut themselves, beat themselves, begged other inmates for their meds, and swallowed a handful of game-changing pills in one gulp. I even knew six chicks who one by one successfully hung themselves within those 15 years I served. In the prison, day room chilling, or on the yard, when the conversation got on, that suicide bullshit, I stepped off. Everybody know Winter Santiago is all about action and hustle, plotting and planning, making it and taking it, and a dead bitch can't do shit. This is fucked up though. Seconds after my prison release, right when I was about to earn a big bag, lights out, I'm dead. When I first approached to do a reality, when I was first approached, to do a reality show that was gonna be so big and so real 
that it would start with cameras rolling the moment I stepped foot through the prison release door. I was like, ah, hell no. Seated side by side with Sully's, I had seen bunches of bitches on reality TV ridiculously playing themselves like crazy. They'd never catch Winter Santiago on camera, finally easing outside with some Department of Corrections issued clothing, which all inmates had to wear other than the clothes they had on their back at the time of their arrest. After that vicious fight me and Simone had on our Brooklyn block 15 years ago, right before the cops snatched both of us, my clothes were shredded. Yeah, that's how we do it. It's not a showbiz on camera, off camera thing in the hood. We fight with full furry. Thinking over the reality show offer while speaking on the prison phone with the show creator and executive producer, my brother-in-law, Elisha Emanuel, I told myself, nah, Winter, never let them see you sweat. Never let them see you down. Never reveal even one chink in your armor. Keep your game face on. Good looking out, Elisha, I told him. I thought about it like you asked me to do, but I got to turn you down for the third time. Let it be the last. Well, then negotiate. My sister Portia said, who I didn't even know was on the call that I made to Elisha, because she remained silent up until the moment I turned him down. You heard what my husband wants out of the show deal. What does Winter want out of it? There must be something you're ready to gain. Just let my husband know what it is. Winter, you are the star of this show. Only you can make it happen. Until you sign the contract, you're in the power position, Portia said softly. My mind started speeding. That's right. What do I want out of it? but I hated that I didn't think of it from that angle myself. Caught up in my hustle on the inside, I didn't consider that I was in the power position in a deal that would go down on the outside even before I get out. This show he's proposing is not just another prison show. That's right. This show is about me, and it's about me for a reason. After all is said and done, there are about 500,000 bitches serving mandatory minimums for basically no fucking reason besides being the girlfriend of some low-level or mid-level drug dealer. Elisha chose me because I'm that bad bitch. The royalist of the royal, precisely. Six days after my sister had said over the phone, well then negotiate. And after referring to my fashion magazine library that spanned over 14 years and was a small source of revenue to me on lockup, I finally realized my list of star demands. The first thing was for Elisha to contact the warden and get, get clearance for me to receive a customized wardrobe and accessories to wear out of the prison on my release day which coincidentally was in the winter season. I got you, Elisha said calmly. I already plan to communicate with the warden and of course the city officials for the license to the film in the area. And Elisha, no brand substitutes, nothing generic, everything genuine, top quality, no matter what anyone says, I told him. I knew what I was about to order. I didn't want to hear him tell me shit about some crazy fucking animal rights protest. I know who you are, Elisha said, buttering me up. Y'all... <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> All right. Starting with outerwear. Since that will get captured on camera first. A hooded white tee. Three quarter length pure mink coat. <laughs> a hooded white three quarter length pure mink coat. Red python sky high thigh high boots. A red alligator Birkin bag with an activated iPhone inside in my name. Red Gucci driving gloves. Oh, and if you're going to continue the film with me being driven home, I want my own house. Poor said you were going to move in with us. She already decorated a whole, a whole wing just for you. It has your own door and driveway, your own bathroom, bedroom, living room, and full kitchen, and even your own mailbox. Once you see it, and since we are all family, I'm sure you'll want to stay. Besides, it's located in Brooklyn. Truth is, I want my own house. I plan to have some of my girls move in with me. We plan to build a business together. Okay, how about a compromise? Something that will make you and my wife and your girl straight and satisfied. Elisha swiftly shifted the combo like someone accustomed to those tough negotiations. I wondered if Porsche was listening in on this call again, but I didn't ask. And if she was, she didn't say shit, and I couldn't detect any extra breathing noises or movements. We will put your girls, up to five of them, in the reality show cast and pay them a nice appearance fee. This way, they can afford their own apartments. You can live with us like Porsche planned. I was silent because I was thinking about it. I thought it would play out better if I am the only star of the show. I make all the paper. I invest the paper into the business that I own and allow my girls to run it so they could earn off of what I had provided. Elisha must have sensed something because he interrupted my thoughts and said, Winter, you're the star. Your deal is worth 50000 per show, six episodes per, six episodes per season. After it hits, 
and you and I both know it will, you be in position to renegotiate and clear even more than the 800000 that is generated for you in Season 1. The five supporting cast members, your hand-picked homegirls, will only each earn 3000 on the episodes they actually appear on. Their backstory. You're on every episode. They're not. You are the main story. You are the show. Elijah's pimp game is mean, I thought to myself. $800,000 for me alone? That's right. Of course I will put my girls on the payroll. That's not coming from my stacks, but it is being paid out to them based on my say-so. 3000 per episode was more than enough for them to pay their rent at the goddamn projects or for each of them to move on up into something new. My on-camera supporting cast sounds good. I cannot wait to give them a heads up and dangle the deal. I did more time than each of them. I would roll out last, but on top, and even save the day for each of them, who after their releases still had not managed to cake up. And let's be serious here. I'm not big on living under the same roof with none of their kids anyway. Now that I am in position to put them on, all of my bitches will bow down. I want VIP passes for everybody who I select to see me styling on my release day. I want a red carpet that runs from the prison release door to the black Bentley that I heard Midnight pushes. And of course, Midnight is the midnight in person waiting on me to walk the red carpet straight to him. You know he's a married man, right? Elisha asked smoothly. I know, but I knew him first. I saw him first. And this is my show we, do, we doing starring me, right? I reminded him. A reality show, Elisha said. You make him show up. I'll make it a reality, I told him with full confidence. Anything else? Elijah asked patiently in his cool tone, not huffing or puffing or making it obvious that my demands might be over the top. So I told him, have the Bentley fully stocked from the old shit to the new shit. Moe, Rosé, Imperial, Hennessy, Exo, Ciroc, Blue Dot, and Ace of Spades, the 30 liter Midas bottle. Oh, and me and my man must sip our champagne from authentic crystal flutes, so order me a set. I gave him full details of the fashions I wanted to wear beneath the mink even though they wouldn't show up on camera for my kiss my ass walk to freedom. Then I added, and there's one serious, really big thing I need to happen, although I won't say it over the phone. Elisha, plan to come up and visit me this week. I'll tell you face to face. <laughs> no problem, I can do that. It's all good. We're in business now, he said as though my list of demands were all things within his budget, influence, connects, and grasp, and I like that. But the thing is, Elisha, if you can't do the one thing that I tell you in person, the whole entire deal is canceled. I said in a firm but non-threatening tone, even though it was a threat. It was more than a threat. It was a promise, a guarantee. We will work it out. See you soon, he said, unfazed, and hung up. Some next chick was waiting to use the prison phone. Although I had already hung up, I was still blocking it. Wonder if I had undersold myself in the deal. Should I have demanded even more? Nah. I knew I would get even more than I demanded anyway. From my young teen years, I saw how entertainers, hustlers, and ballers got all kind of perks, party passes, food and drinks, kicks and cars, trips and wardrobes, and a bunch of other free shit that regular niggas had to grind for a whole year to get one of, or maybe to never get nothing at all. When I was done thinking and blocking, I looked at the chicks on the phone line. They dropped their eyes like they supposed to. Not one of them dared to even look like they had a complaint. They know who run this. Lights out on that same night of the deal combo. Even though I was on track to get what I wanted out of Elisha, I was tight that now Porsche, my young middle sister, would be able to say that she convinced me to do the show that I had said I would never do. Porsche would have me living in their Porsche would have me living in their place, eating off of her plate, and engulfed in her actively annoying <laughs> overkill concern. I don't hate Porsche. We full blood. However, certain little shit that she does and how she is, I definitely don't like. For example, starting with the way she always says those two words, my husband, instead of just calling that sexy brown skin nigga by his well-known name, Elisha Emanuel, young, rich, black, and famous independent movie director. Also, Portia's the quiet type. I don't mind that, but I hated the way she always let her feelings show. On her one visit upstate New York to where I was serving time, she walked in with her eyes filled with watery tears, her voice and fingers trembling. The only reason I overlooked it at the time was because other than that, she was picture perfect. She had the meanest ass manicure that matched her hot couture fashion and the high and thigh high Fendi boots that hood bitches would murder her for. 
slide them right off her legs and feet and onto their own. Once we were seated at the table in a prison room filled with inmates seated at separate tables, she sat trembling and silent like she was in some weird old dreamy phase. When she finally did talk, her voice was all filled with emotion. Then suddenly her watery eyes spilled tears onto her immaculate diamond wedding rings. I was through. I took her off my... <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I took her off my visitation list, even though she was the only one on there. I blocked her. It was a smart move on my part. I know Porsche. She is annoyingly overconcerned about me. After I cut her off, she'll send her sexy husband to check up on me instead. He's a Brooklyn-born Brooklyn nigga, not the hardest money-making murderer, but he's definitely not soft. Me and Elijah could sit and talk at ease. I've been locked up for so long with a bunch of bitches that I easily prefer men, and probably preferred men even before prison. I wasn't trying to lure my sister's man. No, not at all. I don't get down like that, but I respect Elisha. He's my nigga because over time he put money on my commissary, but he never mentioned it. Most importantly, however, Elisha visits Santiago, my father, who is in prison serving life. That means way more than the world to me. All right, y'all. That's chapter one of the book. We know that Winter is dead and also that she was planning before she was murdered to leave prison and have her own reality show. <sighs> Y'all, it's a lot. I don't know how I feel. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just finished the first chapter. It's a lot going on. We know Winter is dead and we know that she was going to start a reality show. Where the story will go, I don't know. I was hoping for a different story. I was hoping that Sister Soldier would have Winter having learned and grown and matured, but she didn't. So I guess we got to read the rest of the book to see what happens. The premise of the book could be good with Winter having gotten killed as soon as she gets out of jail and then having to go through different levels of hell. I don't know. I don't love it. We got to finish reading it. it. It's a lot. She is very selfish. I agree with that. She is so selfish. The entire time she's thinking about herself, she hasn't matured. She hasn't grown. You were in jail 15 years and you still get out thinking the way you did when you first got locked up. I mean, we know that happens in real life, but I'm super disappointed by this. <sighs> anyway, y'all, I'm going to finish reading this book. I'm going to post my book review on my YouTube channel when it's done. I hope y'all all read it. Definitely tune in over there. Y'all, I don't know. We was hoping not to be disappointed and we might be, but... We shall see. We got to finish reading the book, right? So thank y'all for tuning in. I really appreciate it. 100%. And yeah, y'all just wait for the review. My Portia Santiago story, that review is coming up too. So, uh, I don't know. We shall see. All right, y'all. That's it for me tonight. My review will be live soon. I hope that everyone has a good night. And I hope the story gets better than what we just read. Peace, y'all.